Tell me your name, what you do, and where are we? Okay, my name's Amanda Beach. Um, I'm an artist. I sometimes write. Um, I sometimes curate, but I haven't done that for a while. And um, we're in my office at um, CalArts, and I've even forgotten what day it is. It's Thursday, and we're in September as well. I think, I think yeah. you're right. Yeah. That much I know, but yeah. that's, that's it. Okay, so that's, an, that's interesting. The artist position, and the writing, and the curating. Tell me about those other behaviours. Okay. <laughs> what come first? It's yeah, it's nice that you call them behaviours. Um, well, I, I trained, you know, I, I studied as an artist. You know, I did a kind of regular undergraduate fine art degree. And um, through that making, of course, one starts to think about citing work and choreographing audience and understanding the reception of that work. So, so in, in those kind of senses, um, the idea of how that work would be kind of communicated through it, through its site, I guess, became really important. Um, so it wasn't just a fact of making the work and putting it on a wall, but how that would be positioned. And these are kind of quite natural conversations any art student has. But also, um, one of the things that has always been quite important to my work is that it's discussed, or the ideas are discussed, and through discussion it helps me make better work or focus or find problems that I'm dealing with. So throughout my, what, what you call it, an artistic career, I've always discussed ideas with people. Do you think that's a conceptualised position? Like, um, you know, there are some artists that wouldn't talk about their work at all, so there might have been a moment when the necessity to discuss work hit us as a paradigm. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Well, I think all artists talk about work in one way or another, and it might just depend on the way they talk about it. They might talk about it in a very technical way. Um, they might talk about it in a concept, you know, what we'd call a conceptual way, but it's all thought and it's all, yeah. it was all connected to ideas and it all relates to um, their position on their practice. So the choice to not talk, perhaps in a very intellectualised way about ideas, could be quite a, a theoretical decision, you know, yeah. a, a position in the practice to refuse that kind of talk even. So I think that all art's conceptual, all art involves thinking, and all doing relates to thinking. So every time one would choose to pick up a brush and choose a colour, you're thinking about that at some level. And, um, I think people who say they don't um, are kind of lying to themselves in a way because there's thought in every action. So for me, it was just important that the, the kind of territory of discussion around my work was shared and I knew it helped me. And I met lots of other people who felt the same and they benefited from discussion around practice and discussion around context and such and such. And, I guess the more I met other people, the more ideas naturally progressed to thinking about, well, maybe we could curate or discuss this further or formalise it in some way. Okay. And I think that's how a lot of arts collectives are born, aren't they? You know, they just naturally, organically produce through friendships and common interests. So it's in a great step. It's a great move from... Uh, I'm going to do this sort of thing. I'll keep interrupting. Yeah, go, go <laughs> for it. <laughs> Because the ideas come up as we go, and that's the point yeah. of this. Um, so, but the leap to, the you use the word formalised, because as soon as you discuss and you see how it is with others, as soon as you formalise to the point of text, where you sit back and you, no, you don't sit back, you stay back, and you regard, you regard your practice in a particular kind of way. Text is a particular kind of behaviour. So did that come first, or did the curational position come first? Well, I'd always seen writing as a part of my practice. And when I was much younger, I'd write in my sketchbook. My sketchbook had pictures in it and sketches, as you do, but it had a lot of writing in it. And I'd never really considered that writing to be something I would show anyone. It was just like thoughts and ideas that I was trying to grapple with. And so writing was always something that I enjoyed doing, um, but I never really thought about it being something that I had to show anyone. It was just part of the practice, part of the production process for me. Okay. So um, it, 
it was only much later when, um, I guess, there was more interest, I think, um, in recent years to hear artists talk and do discussion panels. I think there's been like more of a move towards having panel discussions in galleries in the past 15 years, say, than there was before, and, and more so now than ever. And I think the more um, that culture grew, the more it became kind of more easy um, to take some of that writing and think, well, maybe this is worth like writing up on, on a computer, maybe, or even showing someone. And I think um, more and more artists are showing people writing now. Where, I mean, in the past, you've got people like Robert Smithson. Yeah, like um, a lot of artists were writing. It was, it was a common thing to do, but maybe now, I think, more than ever, you see that. And, um, there's a bit, okay, I'll tell you what I'm driving at, because there, there's a kind of, uh, I, I, I'm kind of um, wrestling, as everybody I know who's an artist is wrestling with practice as research. Because there's this thing about, uh, there's also the language uh, that's utilised to produce articulation. And there's also Terry Eagleton's kind of rejection at some level of uh, the obfuscation that some academics get into are around. Uh, his argument would be um, that we, I invented this stuff, or I, I, began, I began this stuff to reveal truth. And so much has been done to, to, to obscure truth. So there's a, something very specific about the language of around practice, isn't there? Or is there? Well, first of all, just I hope I'm understanding you correctly and tell me if I'm not, but um, I'd be careful about assuming that art is a more pure form of expression than writing. Uh, they're both forms of mediation, communication. Um, there the might be all... all you know, this assumption that one is more direct than the other and one is less uh, discursive or one's more ambiguous and the other one isn't. And I think that it's kind of incorrect to assume that one um, is privileged as more open and the other one is more closed. Um, that, that's a kind of inherited formalism I think we have between writing and practice. And I think you can have practice as extremely direct and legislative and dogmatic um, and prescriptive, um, and even though it might look ambiguous or neutral, perhaps, it's actually extremely pervasive and rhetorical, and, this, and writing can be extremely open <laughs> at the same time. So I, I wouldn't think that, um, you know, I wouldn't construct a kind of uh, nomenclature or a strict hierarchy in terms of writing and practice like that, but for me it's just more that I know it it, it, coming back to it in a more personal sense, I just know that that process uh, is part of the way I work. It supports my practice. And I think that um, the question of PhDs you raise is important because I did do a practice-based PhD, which is very conducive to the way I work because you're asked to produce a text, a thesis, and also to make. And I was doing that anyway, so it really wasn't a shift for me in the way I worked. And I understand that to be quite a demand for other people and I always think, well, if it's such a demand, don't do it. <laughs> you know, you don't have to do a PhD. Who forced, you know, this principle of PhDs on people? Um, so I just think sometimes, sometimes it's conducive and other, for other people it's not. Um, I think that PhDs, the culture of practice-based PhDs, has generated a new proliferation, if you say, of, of artists writing. And I think there's been quite little analysis of what constitutes that writing and what kind of writing it is. And for me, when I write, I don't really write about art. I, don't, I certainly don't write about my art. Um, I'm more interested in kind of excavating the problems that affect art in a more general sense, that are more to do with political philosophy or the question of art as a paradigm. Um, and how we can think about criticality both within art and beyond it into other forms of culture and, and to politics itself. So I, I actually am not really interested in writing about art at all. Yeah. It's not something that really concerns me because I make art. Yeah. And I guess that's my proposition there. Sure, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
Uh, absolutely. Okay, well, I'm, not, I'm not trying to set up elephant tracks. Uh, no, tracks I think that's on. a really good point, though. Yeah. Okay, so let's go on into the kind of curation or curation. Is there a word? Search? The curation of, or the exploration of the curation of art, because it's um, no. Let me not say anything. Let me ask about that. How 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 did that come about? Because there's a group that you're involved in with regard to the curation of video, moving images. Yeah. yeah um, again, the idea of curating work was just a natural facet of a practice that's discursive at some level and um, so over the years you meet people you talk you share common concerns and then after five more years of sitting in a pub discussing your common concerns you think well maybe we should do something about this so my curatorial practice has never been rushed or felt like it had to be um, it wasn't any attempt to say, I want to be a curator of any kind, but it was more of a, an, an interrogative project to think about how some of these ideas that were shared across various practices could be articulated. And if there was um, a way in which we could think about our specific issues um, in a kind of more close-up close analysis. And that demanded that we kind of did it ourselves because um, the, the kind of things we were looking at were very specific. So with the project that we set up, I think in 2006, called Curating Video, that was myself, Jasper Joseph Lester, who works at Sheffield Hallam, and Matthew Poole, who works at the University of Essex. Um, and together we began to really think through the idea of video media as an ideological material um, force and um, as architecture itself is, had tried to almost annihilate itself by becoming fluid, parametric, um, temporal, event-based. Event so you see that with the, the pavilion at the Serpentine, for example. Um, you see it with all kinds of like the Zaha Hadid, this attempt to undermine the stability of architectural form. When we look at video, people often prize video on the fact that it is already unstable form. And instead, we wanted to think about, well, actually, there's a lot of principles at work when one confronts video. And there is a sense of ideological stability that's wrapped up within that media, whether that's historical, contextual, or what have you. So part of the project was to do away with some of the idealistic um, attributes that one would often give to video, this immateriality. And instead to re really consider the material of video as something that was substantial, forceful, that had strong presence, and would also kind of question the way it had been curated. Um, a lot of times we see artist video being shown in screenings. And sometimes that's detrimental to the work, that uh, an artist video would be involved in a kind of 20 screenings of other artists' video and shown on a wall or, and, and so on and so on. So the treatment of the work wasn't seen as important as, say, a sculpture or a painting that had certain ideas about its territory, the space surrounding it, the way one negotiates it as a viewer. So we wanted to treat video as something that was specific and significant uh, rather than something that was interchangeable that one video could be interchangeable with another or even share the same space. So the demands of video were really important to us as when artists make video, the work is often demanding in terms of space and sight, but sometimes it's neglected by the curatorial community and just seen as, oh, it's temporal, so we can put it anywhere. Yeah. I know full well that a lot of curators don't do that and they are very sensitive to curating video. This is the health warning. Yeah, <laughs> but, but in the majority, I think that video is often treated in, as, it's almost like it's temporality, the very thing that it claimed its left-wing politics from, ends up as being detrimental in terms of its public reception. And there's a kind of contradiction there. In, it's valued on the one hand and then treated as kind of insignificant on the other. So we wanted to really interrogate that problem and think about how we might show video in a particular way that understands its demand, but also to 
work with particular video artists, and these people were making work in all kinds of media as well as video, but we wanted to think about particular video works that demanded something of the viewer also in their content okay. and, and the way they kind of communicated. Do you think, do you think um, the moment that you were doing that, do you, do you think we were, there was any relationship? I, I mean, I'm, I've got a lot of things going on in my head at the moment listening to what you're talking about. One, one of those things is, which is great because it's stimulating ideas, <laughs> um, it, I, there's the analogue thing. Uh, the, the, when it first came in, uh, it was clearly, you know, it's a product of the, you know, the war machine and, and, you know, that technology and then we had analog video and people running around with it for a few years doing that and then the initial film, it seems to me anyway, that the film, the film artist got hold of it and remediated it senseless for a long time and the, certain structures maintained that grasp rather than allowing new, new uses and all of that stuff. But we come up to the digital age, whatever the hell that is, it's a use, you know, it is the time that you would begin to examine the curation of it uh, concomitant with what Baudrillard was predict predicting about the, the meaningless, the increasing meaningless or lack of significance that would grow with the ubiquity of the form? Was there any relationship between you deciding to you know, deal with the curation of it and its proliferation? Mm. Does that make sense? I think it's a good question and um, I, I, I can't say that there was a kind of eventual moment where we claimed that relation, you know, the, the one you're talking about. But certainly the idea of um, ubiquitous media was really important to us. And in fact, we did participate in a conference called Ubiquitous Media as the curating video group, which was in Tokyo in 2007, where we did attempt to think through um, both, as I've said before, the kind of association of political power through its ubiquitous, amorphous um, characters, characteristics, let's say, um, but also how that kind of idealizes video perhaps in, a, in an un untimely way now. Like it, it's more of a nostalgia for a media and a, a, a desire for its ubiquity. Um, and it's interesting then because ubiqu its ubiquity is actually hinged upon it being meaningful it's because it's ubiquitous, it, it has meaning, because it can do anything and go anywhere. Um, but we were more interested instead in, as I said, in how uh, it's not that ubiquity is a kind of myth. It's, it's something that doesn't actually exist. Um, ev because every time you look at video, it's always in a context, it's always in a set of relations that you're in. Um, you, you never actually occupy that space of ubiquity yourself. One just, it's a thought, it's an ideal kind of way of thinking the media. So I, th I think the question of um, meaninglessness, whilst it's exciting and uh, it's almost spectacular to think of the idea of something being meaningless, but, but that means something, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know. So, so that's what we were kind of hope, hopefully interrogating as well, this, this um, way in which the meaningless as a category was accruing a lot of meaning in itself for better or for worse and how that was being kind of dispatched in in kind of the making of video from from the artistic sense you know like the, the actual production and choice of what was in the video yeah. to how it was shown um to how it's then curated and how it's then moved around the world in different spaces and galleries or, or other spaces it struck me as interesting that the, 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 the language around um, attention, you know, in, a, in the 14th century, you might have gathered your attention because you were part of an agrarian society. <laughs> Whereas with the advent of photography, you focused your attention. And now, within capitalist times, we pay attention. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. There's a whole, there's a whole kind of, and, and as we know, there, is no, there are no accidents around anything that we do. So I'm really, a lot of my friends who are investigating digital media seem very, very happy to allow its, from what I can see, is simply an advanced set of computational functions to obtain to this word digital or the domain of digitality or digital, all of this stuff. Do you think that if you strip back all of its functions that there's anything different going on with digitality as opposed to 
the analog realm that we, we come from. So if you strip away the advanced comp computation of functions, the fact we can do it all faster, mm -hmm. is there anything different about this behavior that we're involved in? Well, first of all, I think it would be hard to remove the, the context from the media. As I was saying before, everything operates within particular context. So the, the kind of politics that surrounds the, the media, i.e. It, its use, when I say it's politics, like how it's, how's it de deployed, how is it seen, um, what are its histories, what are the myths surrounding it, you know, it's really hard to um, evacuate all of that from um, the media itself and in many ways it's, it's a kind of scientific project, the question you're asking, because one would need to be some kind of scientist, or a good scientist, a very good one, to, to be studying that, I think, and to, to claim that distinction between a scientific analysis and, and the politics. Um, that, that are involved even in that. So I think it's an, uh, an interesting attempt, but to, to ask me the question of the difference between analog and digital, it's not, I have to say, it's not something that has really concerned me in my work, in, in the sense that in my practice, I make sculpture, I make video, I draw, um, I'll do anything that's necessary in terms of the ideas I work with. So, so Media, for me, is really on a need-to-know basis. It, and, um, it, and I mean that really, that I won't go and learn the whole of Final Cut Pro um, just because it's Final Cut Pro. I'll work out what I think I need and then I'll try and learn that and then get someone to teach me or hire someone to help me. So um, that my relationship to, to media is very much out of, out of a politics of use, I guess and re relates very much to the kind of things that I feel like I need to achieve in the work. So, so the question of the difference between, or my lived difference or differential between uh, the sensitivities between analog and digital isn't something I really encounter on a daily basis in my practice. Um, and, I, and again, um, I think one of, one of the key issues I think that does affect me with, with the distinctions is how the distinctions, distinctions are deployed um, uh, in a kind of utilitarian way to achieve um, an idea of an artwork being considered to be critical or not. So um, we, I think we, we touched on this a little bit earlier where there is an assumption that an analog work is going to be more left wing or critical or um, packing more of a um, a critical punch, let's say, than a, a work that looks digital. Um, we could also think about this in the past five to ten years, this um, more uh, popularization of using, say, f film, like Super 8 film and so-and-so, and then actually um, producing that through, through a digital um, mechanism. So your work is looking like film, but actually it's digital. Do you see what I mean? It's, it's being pulled through the digital. And so I find that really interesting that there's a kind of um, desire for some kind of authenticity through the analogue. Yeah. And I, I actually have a problem with that. I think that it's, it's a, quite a, it's a nostalgic treatment of the mythology of the media. I think analogue or digital media has got more potential than its nostalgic okay. histories. That, that was actually the, the root of that question that I hadn't actually truly articulated to myself, but I'm, I'm coming to it through what you've just <laughs> said, which is about the remediation, the terrible, <gasps> terrible, listen to me using that word, the remediation of what is here with what we knew. So we regard, in a sense, we're kind of regarding what is here uh, with the way that we used to think about the other things. So I'm, I'm interested in what this thing is that is here that is barely, barely articulated or barely described because there's a thing that's going to happen, it seems to me. I, I did an interview a couple of days ago with the uh, president of the American Society of Cinematographers who also runs the MFA at American Film Institute. So he is into, uh, uh, this phrase always comes up in my head, hardcore. Um, dealing with di the digital pathways of production of image to right the way through to exposition on, on uh, the cinema screens. And he has to take his students through a, sp a particularly stringent uh, training of a certain kind. 
But here, here at Cal Arts, of course, you've not, not only got the narrative stuff, but you've also got the experimental stuff. So this question arises about stringency of um, craft and behaviour. Where does, where does that stuff fit? Because on a need-to-know basis about the, uh, as you were saying, about the, the mechanisms of uh, uh, de deriving images, then you don't want to lumber an artist with a load of technical stuff. So where do, where do you come down in that one? Where's your... Well, I guess it's, it depends who you're educating and what the programmes are for, because as, as an artist, as you say, um, um, I think most artists go through their art education with a very open sense of practice, or they're encouraged to have one at most art schools I know. And uh, those choi the choices you make are part of forming what you might call your subjectivity as an artist. And I think most art schools in most countries um, seek to achieve students um, or, or, or that have developed their subjectivity by the time they leave and understand what constitutes their art artistic practice. That's one achievement, let's say, that uh, an undergraduate course could give an artist, uh, a student, mm -hmm. so that they understand what they're, just what they're doing. And that would be quite a good thing because it's tough to do that, um, you know, over a short period of time. But I think that here at Cal Arts, um, and it's something I've yet to really look at, because this is something that would say go on in the film department, for example, which I've visited very briefly, but um, I don't know so much about. But of course, people are being trained for industry, but there's also a very experimental attitude to what constitutes um, film practice and what is required now for that kind of success in, in the industry. So I think that, you know, if I was here to be a film student, I'd really want a foundational training in media, in, in media skills. I think that would be crucial because I've chosen to do a film course. Um, when you say film, do you really mean film? <laughs> well, no, not at all. Um, I'm, when I say film, I'm using the, the title of the programme here, which, yeah. of course, constitutes all kinds of you know, film, digital, lens-based lens, lens -based media, let's say. Yeah. And, um, but of course it's called film, so that's why I'm saying it. But I think that's a distinction though, because if you choose a programme like that, you're, you're actually choosing it because you already know that that's your territory, that's your media. You're choosing it from a media-specific choice. Whereas when you choose to do art, one of the reasons you might choose to do art is because you're willing or you're one of these people who like to play across all different disciplines and media. And so therefore you might be motivated quite differently in terms of your relation to media. And I think that's, that's just those, it's those early choices that people make. And for me as an artist, that's where it's different. So it is more, that's, that's why I think it's more on a need to know basis. Cause I'll learn how to um, do angle grinding and resin fiberglass casting just as much as I learn to do Final Cut Pro if it's necessary for my project. Yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> no, and I have to. <laughs> that's fair enough. I mean, it, the reason that I'm coming from a slightly perverse position anyway, because my study is uh, not only the high resolutions, but the higher frame rates and the higher dynamic range, not only capture but display, and the calibration of those to produce the sweet spot in the human response. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of interested in that tuning up process, which requires a very high level of grasp of um, how this stuff works, otherwise you can't make it work. So I've, I've got a, a perverse position in, <laughs> in relation to all of this stuff. Anyway, okay, so what's the, uh, so uh, this could be the examining board here. Um, <laughs> the relationship between the, so here you are at the moment as the dean of the, the critical, the, 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 the assemblage of ideas in the text. <laughs> I'm trying to find a way of putting it. But your, your co-partners in the exercise here are also a department like practical production. Yeah. I mean, do you see much exchange? Oh, absolutely. I think just looking at the faculty here in critical studies, most of them are practitioners that write. And again, it's that culture I've been describing. And um, we have film, like, like for example, I mean, Steve Anker is currently um, Dean of Film. He's a film curator. He's a curator. So we, we have massive crossovers in terms of all the schools here, in terms of 
what we might call making and writing, making and doing and, and thinking. And so I, I think that that's a real positive kind of environment to be in, that we don't have such clear distinctions like that. So I, I think that that's, again, part of this complexity or messiness that is quite a pleasure to be involved in. And it, and it feels much more like a, an artistic community that, that, that it acts as the umbrella for these kind of more, as you say, these more industrial forms of production that do go on in other schools. Do you intend, do you intend to insert that understanding or that interrogation of, uh, uh, you know, uh, methods of three, freedom within a kind of, in a, in a liberal, in a, in a developing liberal environment mm -hmm. and capitalist practice? I mean, you're going to feed that into the, they, they have to take, I presume, they have to take some critical writing in their, yeah, in their practice too. they always have done, and um, they they already do very much. When I say they, I mean all the other schools like art, theatre, dance, and film. They already do um, invest and regard critique as central to practice. So, um, I was talking with um, the character animation um, critical studies team the other day, and they were telling me about the kind of lectures and discussions they have within character animation and um, so every every student no matter what however industrial the course or the class um, is encouraged to think critically so it's all always already happening and my part here is also to kind of make it happen more and to encourage that to be more well hopefully more organic yeah. you know, something that becomes naturally I, I, okay I've got to return Finally, really. So we've got this kind of we've got this picture, but you've just arrived, haven't you? You've only been here for a short bit. Yeah. Have you had a chance to think of your own practice in this time? Has what <laughs> has happened to you infused you with anything that makes you want to do a particular thing? Well, yeah. to be honest, I'm actually finishing a, a video now, um, which I've been working on for some time, and I'm going to show it in the UK in February, and then it'll be touring to Norway. And I'm also working on a book for that. Um, so I've, I'm involved in, deeply involved in a project that's almost kind of getting to its finishing point. Um, but uh, the, the project was actually filmed in the Mojave Desert, so it's not too far away anyway. And I came out, I've, I've come out here on a number of occasions and worked filming in the desert. Um, so one of, one of the reasons for making the move here was really to be in a location that has constantly inspired my work. So um, it can, and it continues to do so. So um, it, it'll save me some plane fare to, to be living here and I can uh, continue to do my film shoots and uh, get, get some other kinds of work done as well. Could you, could you identify um, the, um, the, the, what, the, what this piece is, is, is about? Can you just... Yeah, I'll try. It's it's hard. I'm sure you know when you're in the middle of something to articulate what it is. Yeah, um, basically it's um, all my practice has been interested in what we could mean by realism and, and what that is in a kind of um, scientific sense, in a in a kind of non-human oriented sense. Um, so what I mean by that is uh, we often look at the, the very complex world we live in, the decentered subject world where we know now that we are not the center of all things, um, that we're not masters of our universe, that what we um, do doesn't necessarily result in the things that we thought they would. We, we are in a world without guarantees and we know that very well. But rather than respond to that and say, well, we can't guarantee our actions. If I do this, I can't say this will happen. And I know that um, the world is much bigger than our Milky Way. Um, you know, so it's a, a larger, larger cosmology at work here. To, to understand our situation in that context isn't a tragic one. And that's really important to me. And it's constantly been something in my work to not understand um, what it is to play a part in the world as being tragic. So rather than see it as a tragic problem of saying, oh, whatever I do, it's not going to work or I'm going to make work about the failure of art because it's never going to achieve its goal and so on and so on. Um, I want you to think about the idea of um, the artwork as something that was demanding and forceful and 
also the way in which language itself is forceful and whether that's the most banal conversation or uh, the most dogmatic speech, that it drives a kind of agenda constantly, whether it's, you know, whether you want a cup of tea and you get it, you know, uh, language works. It, it's not constantly failing. <laughs> and so thinking about how that operates um, in an artwork and in particular video in its, in its temporality is extremely interesting to me because that's when we can think about the dynamic image, um, the vitality of an image, but also how the image, um, particularly in video, I think, is very demanding on audience. And I enjoy that, that it should be demanding and it articulates that demand. So rather than be um, weak or poor, as say Hito Stahl might say, I'm very interested in all images as having some strength. And um, I remember, you know, a long time ago reading Heidegger, and um, I'm not Heideggerian, but he, he was very interested in language, as we know, and he said that we must take images seriously and know their power. And I think that's always something that's really stuck with me, that images do have power. So in the sense, this work continues my kind of interrogation and pleasure in that kind of force of the image and how we kind of think ourselves um, politically um, past these problems of the tragic um, and how we might think of images as having, having power. So the work itself um, looks at a, a kind of fictive, um, essayistic, but abstract essayistic kind of uh, response to some of these questions to, to get us out of that. So it doesn't really answer the question really, but it kind of just, I hope it describes the kind of position of the work and yeah, the practice in a larger sense.